Shalom and uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to class. Uh, we began studying uh, Second Timothy uh, last week. Uh, we did chapters one and we began studying chapter two. Uh, we looked at chapter two right up to verse uh, seven, where we looked at uh, three analogies uh, that are that Paul mentions in verses three to verse seven uh, in chapter two, where he's talking about the analogy of a soldier, an athlete, and a farmer, and basically trying to highlight few characteristics uh, for Timothy uh, to be a good minister of the lord and how he um, you know needs to serve god as a good minister so we we'll continue with the uh, second timothy chapter 2 verses 8 onwards and before uh, we look into god's word and before we study god's word uh, let's just pause for a word of prayer so we can ask uh, uh, success or linden anyone to lead us in prayer please Linden or success, anyone can lead us in prayer, please. Good morning. Good morning, success. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, ma. Uh, are you saying something to me? Yes, I asked you to lead us in prayer, please. All right, let's pray. Oh, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, the almighty King of glory, we want to thank you this morning for giving us the privilege to be alive again, to learn at your feet this morning. Be thou glorified in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we commit, we commit our lecture into your hands this morning. My Father, my God, please, Lord, guide us and give us that wisdom from you in the mighty name of jesus above all O oh lord all we have been learning my father my god let it be useful in your kingdom and benefit of our life and everyone around us in the name of jesus christ father we commit our lecture into your hands our pastor father release your wisdom unto her in the name of jesus christ thank you my father in jesus name we pray amen Uh, so we'll continue looking at chapter 2, verses uh, 8 onwards. Can one of you please read verses 8 to 10, please? Second Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. Can one of you please read? Amen. Thank you. That is all. Man. Actually, my network is giving me issue. Uh, success, could you mute your mic, please? Yes, yeah, thank you. If someone can read uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8 to 10. Go ahead, Rubega. Remember that that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, for which I suffered terrible as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. But the, Lord, the word of God is not chained. Therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Amen. Thank you, Rubega. So here Paul is telling, reminding Timothy, saying, remember, you know, what he needs to keep um, in the forefront of his message. And so he's telling him what he needs to preach or what he needs to teach. So he's saying that in the forefront of your message, you need to talk about, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, the truths of who Jesus is. So he's saying that, you know, speak about this. He's saying uh, that Jesus is the seed of David, you know, which uh, is uh, 
basically meaning to say that even though Jesus was fully God, he was fully man. Uh, uh, another important aspect he's mentioning here is he was raised from the dead, uh, which is a great fact and a great credential that authenticates, uh, uh, you know, or gives authenticity to what Jesus Christ has done, uh, that he has made that full, sufficient, perfect sacrifice. And resurrection basically is attesting or proving to the fact that Jesus' sacrifice, yes, was indeed full, sufficient, and perfect. Um, it was something that was pleasing to God. It pleased the heart of God. It also... Uh, um, appeased uh, God in the sense that, you know, the debt for sin was fully made. So resurrection is uh, is important in that sense because it, it, it proves that, you know, that God the Father was pleased with the sacrifice and the atonement was made in full and, uh, you know, uh, restitution was also made for the sins of the entire mankind and it just... Uh, uh, you know, the God that was wronged uh, by our sins, uh, the debt was paid in full. Okay, so basically the trespass offering that required atonement and restitution for our sins. So it's talking, uh, resurrection gives uh, credibility to the attention authenticity of what Jesus Christ has done. You know, so he's saying uh, Jesus Christ is raised from the dead, uh, which means now he is, uh, he is gone back to the Father, he is God. Uh, so for Paul, you know, it was essential that Timothy remembers these important truths and teaches these important truths. And then Paul says, you know, according to my gospel, you know, of course, uh, gospel uh, belonged to Paul in the sense that he preached it, uh, but it also belonged to him in the sense that he believed it. And it was his gospel um, because, you know, he received it, he received revelations. And uh, look at how he, he personalizes this whole gospel. It's not something that he was just called to, something that he has to do, something that he has to suffer for uh, the sake of God, you know, the sake of the gospel. But um, it was something that he believed in, his sense of ownership. So that is how we should uh, look at the gospel, you know, or that is what the gospel should mean to each one of us as individual believers and uh, Christians. So, you know, this gospel that we have received is something that uh, we don't just keep to ourselves, but we preach. Um, and also it's a gospel that we would be, you know, uh, should be willing to endure hardships uh, and when we endure hardships for the sake of the gospel, you know, others can obtain salvation. So he's saying in uh, verse 9, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer. So he's saying that I'm suffering for the sake of the gospel, but I'm suffering here as somebody who's doing evil. Okay. Uh, and he's saying even to the point of the of chains, but the word of God is not uh, changed. So Paul is telling Timothy. Uh, look at me, Timothy, you know, I'm preaching the resurrected Savior. I'm preaching this Jesus, who he is. And, uh, and look at me, where I am. I am in chains. But so he's telling Timothy that I'm not just telling you that you should end your hardships. I'm not just telling you that you should work hard for the sake of the gospel. I'm not just telling you that, hey, you need to stay put in your uh, post that God has called you to. But look at me as well. You know, I'm also going through hardships i'm also suffering i'm here because not because i'm an evil doer or done something evil but i'm here because the sake of the uh, gospel and i'm in chains uh, and i'm doing so so that we can receive salvation so he's basically uh, encouraging timothy he's reminding timothy uh, the calling that we have why the gospel is entrusted to us calling is not just a privilege but it's also a responsibility you know um and even when we go through suffering and persecution for the sake of the gospel you know we should uh, look at it in a positive way we should look at it in a in a sense that hey this is going to serve the furtherance of the gospel through this you know people are going to receive salvation Okay, so that is the whole purpose of us uh, 
receiving the gospel, preaching the gospel, teaching it, and also living out the gospel so that others can be saved. We'll move on uh, to verses 11 to verse 13. Can somebody read verses 11 to 13, please? Can someone please read verse 11 to 13? This is a faithful saying, for we were, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, we sh he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Amen. Thank you, Lubina. So what is Paul trying to mention by saying, uh, uh, you know, by writing these three verses? Uh, he's saying that, hey, this is our hope. In the midst of enduring hardships, you know, this is our hope that if we die, we will live. Okay, uh, We will live only if we endure hardships, you know, uh, uh, if we endure and stay and stand firm in our calling, uh, in our love for Christ, you know, we are going to pray. And we all know that, you know, uh, uh, suffering is just momentary. It will pass away. But there will be a time when we will reign, a reign in the millennium kingdom with Jesus. So even as we suffer now, Paul is suffering, he knows Timothy is suffering, but he's giving him hope in the midst of his um, hardship. He's saying we have hope we will reign with him. Okay. But on the other hand, Paul is also reminding Timothy the consequences of what if we deny. Okay. The consequences of denial is also uh, is severe. You know, if we deny him, but there is no choice for God to deny us. Okay, remember Jesus said, "If we can confess Him before men, He will confess us before the Father in heaven. And if we deny Him before men, He will also deny us before the Father in heaven." Okay, um, so our denial or our denying Jesus Christ and us becoming faithless, you know, does impact us. Uh, it impacts us to a great extent, but we need to remember it does not change anything from God's end. You know, it does not change anything from his end, which means that if any of us, you know, had, had moments when we denied the Lord, uh, you know, or we did go through moments of faithlessness, you know, there are, we can get back to God because he has not changed. He's the same uh, un uh, same forgiving, gracious, compassionate, merciful, loving God. You know, he hasn't changed. He would always receive us back. He will forgive us, okay? And because he still remains faithful to who he is. And he will um, strengthen us. He will revive us. He will bring us uh, back. And he will take us to higher uh, levels, okay? Because he continues to stay faithful even in the midst of our ups and Okay, so uh, uh, what is, is there a difference between denying and faithless? You know, denying is basically outrightly saying no, right? You denying means you're saying no, I did not do this. Uh, you know, and faithless is when we go through moments of up and ups and downs in our faith. When sometimes our faith is slow and down, sometimes it's you know really high. But in spite of all that, God still remains faithful. So our denial and our faithlessness, you know, impacts us, but it does not change anything from his end. Okay. Uh, we we'll move on to verses 14 and 15. Before that, anyone has any questions or doubts? Okay. Can someone read verses 14 to verse 18, please? Second Timothy chapter two verses fourteen to eighteen. Can someone read that? Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord, not to strive about words to no profit, to 
ruin of the careers. Be diligent to present yourself at work to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. And their message will spread like cancer. Himenius and Philippus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past and they overthrow the faith of some. Amen. Thank you, uh, Zelatoli. So, as uh, 14, um, Paul is you know, saying, remind them of these things. You know, so after reminding Timothy of the essential points of the gospel or the essential truths of the gospel, Paul uh, adds on uh, to, to remind Timothy what his hearers need to hear. So he Paul added that Timothy must always remind his hearers of these things. So, you know, basically, uh, the things that he has mentioned is in Second Timothy chapter two verse eight. He says, "Remember that Christ Jesus, of the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel." And then, you know, what are the other things that he needs to remind them of? Is Second Timothy chapter two verse eleven to thirteen it says, "Wherefore, if we die with him, we shall also live with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful; he cannot deny himself." So Timothy's job as a pastor, you know, was to keep his congregation always focused on the gospel, you know, uh, and that also reminds us as uh, ministers of God, pastors, people who are teachers of the word of God, you know, um, sometimes we can preach or teach what people want to hear, you know, um, uh, it can just be stories, it can be philosophies, it can be, uh, you know, uh, things that would um, would uh, show us as good orators, talkers, you know, preachers. But it's important that as ministers of the gospel, it's important that we stay focused on teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to the uh, people. Okay, so we must teach, we must exhort God's people. Um, uh, you know, from the word of God, from the gospel, the truth that is in the word of God. And so he's also telling Timothy that, you know, we must also teach and exhort God's people to stay away from engaging uh, in useless things like fighting over words, uh, ideas, arguments that bring uh, no benefit. Okay, we've already looked at this in First Timothy. Uh, so he's just reiterating this and he's telling him, you know, don't have anything to do with all of these things because this is not, you know, arguments and uh, fighting over words is not going to bring benefit to anyone. And then verse 15, he says, be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So be diligent basically means, you know, be focused, you know, and um, this is an ongoing, uh, continuous work, uh, and we need to pursue this with great perseverance, endurance, and you know, carefully, um, or, you know, in, uh, be focused uh, in preaching and teaching uh, God's word. But also here, he's telling areas when you need to be uh, diligent. Okay, he says the first area he says be diligent to present yourselves as one approved to. God. That means be someone, Timothy, who lives in a manner that is pleasing and honorable and righteous before um, God. Walk in a way that is righteous and holy and pleasing before God. And the other area that he's talking about in being diligent or being focused is that, um, you know, um, or you need to do uh, pursue it with great uh, uh, earnestness is be a worker who does not need to be ashamed okay means work in such a way that you will not uh, you know you will not put God to shame you will not grieve the Holy Spirit you will not quench the Holy Spirit um, and you know 
uh, you will not have to do anything that you stand ashamed before God, which means he's basically telling him, fulfill your calling and what God has asked you to do. And the third thing, of course, you know, he's saying, rightly divide the word of God. Be careful how you handle the word of God, you know, um, rightly dissect it. Uh, you know, so it's important that you understand the truth, you understand the word of God and teach it in the right way. Okay, so even as Paul is um, telling, uh, mentioning these, enlisting these three areas where uh, Timothy needs to be uh, diligent or focused as a pastor, uh, as one who's called by God, it also speaks to us in our time and in our age that we need to be diligent to present ourselves as one who's approved to God. Also, secondly, to be a worker who does not need to be ashamed and rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, As pastors, it's in essential that we work hard uh, to master the right to uh, uh, right, know the right tools of interpretation and interpret the word of God in the right way. Because there are so many interpretations or so many um, theologians with their commentaries, their interpretation of the word of God. It's it's okay to read them, but ultimately ask the Holy Spirit to reveal the truth uh, to us so that we can interpret the word of God in the right way. So he's saying, you know, we need to be very, very careful how we handle the word of God, because if you listen to many well-known uh, speakers and preachers, uh, you know, there are many things that they preach well, but if you listen to them in some of their messages, they're slowly digressing away from the truth or the doctrine that is in the word of God. And it's important when you hear them not to just take everything or receive everything, but important to go back and, and see whether it's the truth or uh or is aligned with the rest of scripture because scripture interprets scripture. So the rest of scripture is also talking about the same thing. So these are the three areas we also need to be diligent, um, uh, you know, and it's an ongoing continuous work that we must, uh, you know, pursue with great earnestness. In verse uh, 16, um, you know, and 17 and 18, he's basically telling uh, Timothy, don't involve in any idle silly talk and then he's mentioning two people here Hymenius and Pilatus um, uh, you know we do not know anything much about uh, these two men only that uh, Hymenius we read about Hymenius in First Timothy chapter 1 verse 20 where uh, Paul tells him uh, you know to hand him over to Satan um, but all we know about these men were these men were engaging in uh, uh, ungodly talk and useless talk, uh, which was kind of destroying uh, the faith of others, you know. Um, so Paul um, dealt with them, uh, and as he mentions in First Timothy chapter 1, verse uh, 20, okay. So he's saying that, you know, be careful of these uh, people and the message that they are speaking about because they are overthrowing some from the faith and um, then he goes on to uh, tell timothy a few more things in verses 19 to 21 uh, so can somebody please read verses 19 to 21 please verses 19 to 21 nevertheless the solid foundation of god stands Having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some of honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleans himself from the letter, he will be a vessel for honor sanctified and useful for the maker prepared for every good work amen thank you Rubega. so paul is saying nevertheless the solid foundation of god stands having this seal so he's saying 
no, no matter what these false teachers are teaching, no matter what message they are spreading, whether their message is spreading like wildfire or like cancer that destroys a person's faith, that destroys a person's um, spirit, soul, and body, you know, um, and overthrowing some from their faith, you know, uh, it doesn't matter, you know, uh, if they're doing all of this, you know, um, what Paul is making clear is that the kingdom of God cannot be shaken. Okay. So he's saying no matter, even if some are overthrown from their faith, it doesn't matter how many fall away, how many reject the truth, how many go after these uh, profane and vain babblings, Paul is making something clear that the kingdom of God cannot be shaken. Okay. There are false teachings, there are uh, false arguments, um, and their debates and everything that they're saying, you know, nothing is going to matter. Nothing is uh, going to shake the kingdom of God. Yes, some people may fall away. Some will reject the truth. You know, some will follow after these vain and profane babblings, but nothing uh, would uh, shake the kingdom of God. Okay. And then he talks about uh, the... He quotes basically the Old Testament says, the Lord knows those who are his and let everyone who knows the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Basically, he's quoting from uh, or mentioning the story from Numbers chapter 16, you know, where he's talking about Korah's rebellion against Moses. And, um, you know, the Korah and a few other people uh, rebel against Moses. And Moses tells them, you know, the Lord will show who his is and who is holy and will bring him near to himself, even the one whom he will choose. So like you know, these people were saying, hey, Moses, are you the only leader God has chosen? Has he not chosen us? He's not chosen others as well. And so that was Korah's rebellion. So Moses is telling them that, you know, God will show you. They were all called to the tent of meeting and God was going to show him himself and, you know, who is the leader he has chosen. So he says, the Lord will show you who is his and who is holy and bring him near to himself, even the one whom he will uh, choose. So he basically also, you know, in Numbers chapter 16, verse 26, he warned the congregation to depart from uh, the tents of these wicked men before God is going to destroy them. So God, you know, actually showed up and he showed them that he had chosen Moses as a leader and how he destroyed Korah and the other men who rebelled. Uh, so tells them to, he wants the congregation to depart from these tents of these wicked people, uh, you know, before God will destroy them. So it's true that God knows who are his and he calls those who are his, uh, you know, to leave their sin behind and, you know, to pursue him, to do what he has purposed and called them uh, to. So, you know, um, even as God's um, a solid foundation of God still stands, the kingdom of God cannot be shaken, you know, um, the same way God has also given us a solid, solid foundation on which we can stand against all of these false teachers, all of these, um, you know, uh, vain babblings, profane and vain babblings. It's a solid foundation of the truth in his word. So we need to keep our focus on what God has given us as the solid foundation that his word and focus on it, on it and study it and, uh, you know, um, and that, let that uphold our uh, lives. And then Paul goes on to draw from an analogy of uh, utensils at home. Now, you know, in each of our homes, we have um, vessels that we use for ordinary everyday use. And then we have uh, special vessels that we use for special occasions and special uh, purposes, okay? And some of uh, these utensils that we have for special purposes, special uses, you know, is something that is very prized for the, some of us, is uh, expensive. And, uh, you know, uh, when we have guests at home, when we have special uh, occasions and functions, we bring out these uh, 
uh, utensils and we are kind of proud of it because the the beauty and you know the design and how expensive it is and how beautiful and nice it uh, looks so we just put them on uh, display and it's basically used to serve um, you know special food and you know when we have special guests at home okay now uh, here paul is saying to be a vessel for honor you know this meaning a vessel that can be used for special purposes okay for honorable use uh, so uh, and it's a vessel that brings honor so you know if you want to be a vessel that god wants to use that he wants to put on display that he wants to you know release his anointing his power his uh, purpose you know then there are four things uh, that we need to do there are four important requirements uh, to be that vessel of honor now before i mention the four things you know um, here it does not say that you know only few of them are chosen to be vessels of honor okay and few are chosen to be vessels for ordinary use it's not that god has chosen some of us for ordinary use and he's not it's not that he's chosen some of us for uh, special use but what does uh, the word of god say here he says that um, you know um, but anyone therefore if anyone cleanses, cleanses himself from the latter okay he will be a vessel of honor sanctified and useful for the master prepared for every good work okay so if you cleanse yourself you know and you set yourself up uh, you know uh, of things that is not dishonoring in god's sight you're basically setting yourself up as a vessel for honor where god can sanctify you and use you um, for the good work that he has prepared in advance even before the foundation of the world for you to uh, do so that is very very encouraging that um, the op uh, the opportunities for anyone to be a vessel of honor it's open to all anyone can step in but there's work to be that there's something that we need to do on our <coughs> sorry there's something that we need to do on our part and what is that that we need to do um four requirements first thing is being to be cleansed which means that you know we need to depart from sin you know we need to cleanse ourselves from dishonor we need to leave sin move away from sin not feed our sinful fleshly desires and lusts and passions of the flesh the first thing is to be cleansed the second one is to be sanctified which means to be set apart to be holy as unto the lord the third thing is to be useful which means we need to be uh, readily available uh, readily uh, to be used by the master and the fourth one is to be prepared that means uh, to equip ourselves to be ready to be used by the father okay so these are the four things that we um, need to do and um, you know when we step in and work to fulfill these requirements you know we become a vessel of honor okay where a god can uh, you know uh, use us for the good work that he has prepared for us even before the foundation of, uh, of the world and we can be uh, useful for the uh, master okay so we see that we remember we read this even in um, verse one that it's uh, possible by the grace of jesus christ okay sometimes we think hey how can i meet these four requirements it's not something that we do it in our own strength, but it's possible by the grace of God. And we studied this in uh, uh, in verse one. And then he goes on to talk, uh, tell Timothy a few more things that he needs to do. Uh, so we'll continue reading from verses uh, 22 to 26. Can somebody read verses 22 to 26, please? Anyone would like to read a Second Timothy chapter two verses twenty-two to twenty-six? Flee also, also. 
Go ahead, Zello Todi. We also you told us but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart, but avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not uh, quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the, uh, the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Amen. Thank you. So here he's saying, you know, in the view of becoming a vessel of honor, you know, sometimes uh, when we look at people who God is, uh, you know, being uh, using them mightily, you know, they're just fulfilling the purpose of God. God is uh, just powerfully using them. We can see great anointing, a great move of God in their lives. We think, you know, uh, God has chosen them. You know, for that specific thing. It's not that God has just chosen them and not chosen us. God has chosen all of us. And he has great plans and purposes for all of us to do. It's only that these people have come to a place where they want to be that vessels of honor. I don't know how many of you desire, uh, you know, to be vessels of honor, to do great things, to accomplish great things for God, uh, for his kingdom, uh, to see his kingdom be mightily uh, extended in and through your lives. And so, you know, if you, you know, um, desire to do that, you know, God is more than pleased, more than uh, happy to you know, just pour out into your life and um, use you mightily for what he has planned and purpose for your life. So he's saying here in the view of becoming that vessel of honor, you know, we have only one choice. And what is that choice? Stay away from ungodly lusts, ungodly passions and desires. And instead, we say, pursue righteousness, faith, love and peace. And he's saying, do this with those who call on the Lord with a pure heart. So here it's an idea of togetherness and community. Okay, uh, So be part of a community where they are pursuing righteousness, faith, love, and uh, peace. So, you know, we, um, uh, we live out our life in community, which means we live along with others who also pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, godliness, holiness. You know, and if you want to be vessels of honor, you know, we need to be with those who are doing the same thing. Okay. Because when they're doing the same thing, we also have the passion and that desire to do the same thing. Okay. So, um, you know, God is calling all of us, you know, to flee uh, uh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, and to pursue righteousness. Um, uh, to do what is right in God's sight um, and, you know, pursue faith, love, peace with those who call on God with a pure heart. And then he says, you know, avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. We've always, also already seen this. And he's saying, the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach and patient. So he's saying, Hey, Timothy, there will be people who oppose you, oppose the gospel, who oppose Jesus Christ, and how do you handle them? You know, he's saying, don't, firstly, don't get into foolish uh, arguments and disputes because you know that uh, they're not going to bring an end to anything. That's not going to achieve anything. Uh, it just produces division and strife. And then he says, secondly, you know, a servant of God must not fight, must not quarrel, but must be gentle and patient teaching everyone and even as you gently patiently teach and correct everyone do so in humility even those who are opposing you you know you need to be gentle because we know the word of god says a gentle and a quiet spirit is great worth in god's sight okay so why is he telling him this because um you know um uh, you know, those who are doing this are basically taken captive by the devil, the snare of the uh, devil. And, you know, we can't uh, win over uh, 
by just arguments. We just let the, let the spirit of God move in them and work in them. It is and it is God who would you know who can, who alone can move them. It's God alone who can bring them to a place of repre, uh, repentance. It's God alone who can help them to embrace the truth. So you know they can come to their once they come to the senses they know that you know or once they are out of the fellowship under the power of the uh, devil uh, you know they're going through difficulties and hardships you know and they come to their senses and they come out of the snare of the devil and you know they are in right relationship with uh, god you know uh, they they can they would not indulge in things that are of the uh, wrong teachings and doctrines and so he's telling Timothy this is how you need to minister or work along or uh, you know how do you uh, uh, how do you treat or how do you retaliate or how do you handle people uh, who oppose the gospel who oppose you he's saying do this uh, you know treat them in all gentleness be patient with them you know and teach them in gentleness correct them in humility those who are opposing you okay and also this shows us the importance of prayer that you know while we do our part in sharing and teaching the truth in all love and gentleness and patience we need to also pray that people would come to the truth they would know the truth they would come out of the snare of the evil one even as the evil one is taking them captive with um, uh, with his lies, that they would come out, they would overcome the enemy, and they will uh, know the truth, and the truth will set them free. Okay. So that is Second um, Timothy chapter two. Anyone has any questions, doubts, anything that you need more clarity on? You can ask. Before we move on to chapter three, no questions, no doubts. Okay, then no questions, no doubts. Then we'll move on to. Uh, Second Timothy chapter three. So I like all of you to please turn to uh, Second Timothy chapter three, and uh, we can all read that. So there are basically um, seventeen verses. Um, So if five of us or five of you can, um, you know, read um, three verses each and some of you can read four and help finish. So different people can read three, three verses each. And we have someone who's never read. Five of you can just read three verses. Or three of you can read five to six verses. That's also fine. Anyone like to start? Okay, let me start. Um, Second Timothy chapter three, verse one. I'll start from there. But know this: that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boosters, fraud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, strong, uh, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Thank you, Zenatoli. Can someone else continue reading? I thought are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women, loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, 
always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And as Janus and Jambres uh, resisted Moses, so these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapproved concerning the faith, but they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all, as theirs also was. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me in Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Amen. Thank you, John Paul. Can someone read verses 12 to 17, please? Anyone else likes to read 12 to 17? Verses 12 to 17. Just and all who desire to live worldly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in these things which you have learned and have been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Amen. Thank you. Uh, we'll begin studying chapter three. Uh, before we study chapter three, is there anything that really, uh, you know, caught your attention here? Anything that really spoke to you? You know, you've or maybe you read Second Timothy chapter three, or you heard a sermon, and the truth was reiterated in your heart. You know, even as we were um, reading this uh, scripture portion, or anything that God spoke to you, like to share, or uh, any verse from this uh, passage that is close to your heart it reminds you of something that God taught you? May anyone like to share? Anyone? Nothing from this uh, passage of scripture. Yeah, so I love the last, uh, like verse 15, it says, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures. You put an image? So in verse 15, it says that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which I will make you uh, wise for salvation. Uh, I just I just love it how it says, like, you wise for salvation, how the scriptures uh, makes us experience. I think, uh, like, knowing Jesus is, is one part, and then uh, learning about Jesus is, uh, is another part, I believe. So, so the more and more... Uh, I know, I know the scriptures, the more and more, like I can see even the difference from first year, second year, and third year, the more people we know, it, it makes us experience uh, uh, how sweet the salvation is. And one thing I love about the scripture, we just never get tired of it. Like uh, we study the same book over and over and over again, which the worldly people can never do. Once they are done with the book, they just want to go to the, the next one. But something about the Bible is, it always makes us right, makes us learn new things. Um, so that's like how it says, like make you wise for salvation. Something about that just stood out. Thank you, Jeffina. Uh, 
we, it's time for our break now. We'll go for our break and come back and begin our study on chapter two. Thank you.